Welcome, everyone. We have Andrew, Brian, Corvin, Jan, and Rodney, and myself, Michael Dexter. How is everyone doing? I'm doing. Hey, doing, yeah. You sound like you've had a busy, busy week. Uh, Jan, you were saying you've been updating the S6 ports and you've encountered bugs with the features that you'd like to use. Is there anything you want to share about that? Um, the latest uh, January of 2023, uh, um, Skyware release uh, added support for multi instant services, which I want to make use of for Beehive. Um, having a template folder generated once and then an instance of this template service per virtual machine. Uh, the advantage of that is that uh, I no longer have to generate a unique service definition for each virtual machine so that the Ansible worlds can have a reasonable runtime for managing all of this. Um, right now, my Ansible setup is getting too slow for comfort. Um, and this would make it easy to split the uh, slow set up in a role which is only executed once to prepare the host and then have the quick role for managing individual uh, or small sets of virtual machines. And what issue did you bump into? When the um, template is changed uh, upon compiling and loading the new uh, service definitions, uh, into S6RC, the instances get uh, removed and then basically the service manager forgets that it had created instances previously and they just drop off the uh, screen as unmanaged processes, oh. which isn't uh, ideal. Was this a release candidate or a full release? Uh, no, no, this was a um, new feature and the bug was caught quickly. I uh, wasn't even the first one. By the time I've identified it, it was already, yeah, okay. Um, but uh, it's a known issue. It's a new feature. It was dropped. It wasn't a release, but uh, it was a release, but it wasn't the testing only feature, but it was a new feature and uh, like all of three people made use of it so mm -hmm. far before it was caught. <laughs> Do you sense that the S six folks are responsive and yes, working on uh, that? They are, and uh, expect to release within days. Ah. Because uh, it's not that hard to fix. It's a bit annoying, but because it requires a format change to preserve slightly more data, but that's fine. Understood. Uh, welcome, Santiago. Anything else, Jan, in that? area not really um so uh for in case anyone hasn't heard so uh alexander martin's changes solved uh, all of the problems i had with uh with io SCSI in freebsd so now uh tags work as expected turns out the kernel wasn't just uh truncating the tags but uh, replacing them because it didn't trust user space to provide uh, correct uh, tags. Instead, it replaced them with a less than ideal uh, scheme. Cool. But that it worked for the CTL admin tool because it didn't do it. So instead of basically, yeah, in theory, there's a field for it, but the kernel just never trusted any user space application to provide uh, tags. Cool. It reported them back, but that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, staying in Europe for a moment. Welcome. Oh, yeah. Welcome, Santiago. Uh, Corvin, do you have any development news? Uh, hello, hello. I uh, gave my female config uh, patches another try. So, I uh, base them and uh, split them into some smaller commits and um, yeah, started a new upstream process. And I already got some feedback uh, yeah, from Mark and uh, Rod. And um, yeah, 
besides that, uh, Mark Johnson found an um, issue that old uh, Beehive um, binaries are compatible to the uh, BMM kernel module of um, the main as uh, of yeah, FreeBSD main. Uh, and but he also already provided a fix for this. That is good news. Um, is uh, if if you've broken those up, is there like a parent review you can post in chat that links to all of them? Uh, for my female pitches. Oh uh, yes, the ones that are getting feedback. If convenient, drop it in. If not, that's okay. Yeah, one moment. Uh, okay. And in Fabricator, you can uh, create a commit stack. So um, where one commit links to another and says, oh, I need this commit uh, before. So dependency. So yes. So I can Great. send you the last commit. And then when you go on the stack tab, you will see all commits which are related to the female config. Perfect. That is that. that. Uh, independent of your work is awesome and your work is awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else to report? And I didn't, uh, we'll get, we'll get to, uh, uh, let's see, 13, two in a minute, but let's hold that off. Thank you for that link. I'll grab that, put it in. Very cool. Uh, welcome, Santiago. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Hello, guys. So that said, uh, Santiago, you mailed me and said, you know, we're having, well, one, it sounds like you're still having VNC issues and a little bit on just transparency on a running machine of like what debug information can we extract? And as a new feature, QCAT2. So if, uh, I, I'd love to touch on all of those in whatever order you please. Yeah, I guess the VNC is not important. I mean, they, they, they are still having issues. So the guys that are operating some of the servers with Beehive, they see a random crash on, on VNC when they are doing debugging or something, um, or when, when they break a VM and they need to connect directly. Um, but then I think that the, the most, I mean, the, the biggest problem for us is that every time people are downloading images on the internet, they are in QCO2. So and this is adding extra steps for them for deploying the machines. So it's like the, the, the standard question is, hey, why there is no support for QCO2? Uh, what, what's uh, the, the reasoning behind just to not accept the standard and industry standard? Um, so my answer is just use Q, QMU tools and convert it. But um, yeah, this, this is what we are getting also from the customers, why there is no support for for standard formats. Is that a convenience question or are you in a situation where a vendor has a virtual machine that needs to stay pretty much unmodified and if you convert it, you Correct. lose your warranty or something? Correct. Yeah. 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 Most, Can you most give a hint of, of either what type of utility VM that is or give an exact name? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Most of them are images from, from Juniper. Um, okay. Like some, yeah, some tools that are already pre-packed, you know, appliances, virtual appliances, and those kind of things. Just to play devil's advocate, if uh, they're provided as uh, QCO2 and you're not supposed to convert them into another image format, they're it's, probably yeah. even more um, um, restrictive in which hypervisors you're allowed to use, aren't they? Um, usually they don't complain. It's, it's more the customer who complains. Uh, but with Juniper probably, or, or let's say Juniper, or could be Cisco or others, uh, Fortinet has the same, they do QCO2. Mm. Um, you know, with when things work, everything's okay. But when things start breaking, they ask, hey, why, what type of image or no, what's going on? Why you convert the image from one format, format to another one? For sure, they will complain about a big hive at some point, yes. Mm, what, what, what we are trying to do or what we do on the calls is we are saying, hey, look, we are just using your images and, and it works. Can you just put it as a supported hypervisor? Yeah, because it works. Uh, but then, yeah, you know, 
but the annoying part is that this sounds like um, a non-technical problem because converting between image formats should be in any decent hypervisor fully transparent to the guest. The guest should have no way to find out if, if its image is a raw image, a ZVOL or a QCOV2 file. It's only a control plane issue on the hypervisor side. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's and, more like operational issue, not, not, not a technical, to be honest. Exactly. And the operational issue um, is totally valid and should be addressed uh, and could easily be addressed uh, as an operational issue by having quick and easy to use import and export uh, tools like the QA Emo, uh, image tools to convert from and to uh, QCO2. Insisting that at runtime, you have to go through a compressed uh, and basically logical volume management layer mm. file format um, would complicate all the disk access paths in Beehive because Beehive kind of expects that it can just use the virtual block number wow. basically directly and doesn't have to do any form of translation. Um, but it, mm. So w one of the use cases, for example, is we have some some VMs here running Sarix, mm -hmm. and this I think they're in six hundred gigs, seven hundred gigs, and they wanted mm -hmm. to migrate it to Beehive, and then they said, "Hey, we need to convert a massive disk into raw mm -hmm. format," and it's, it's, I say they get into those things that. I agree with you. It's not a big deal, but the question is like, why? Why? Okay. Why is not supported? Yeah. The answer is because uh, the VMN and Beehive didn't have a need for it because both FreeBSD and Solaris based operating systems have ZFS for big mm. deployments, and in, once you have ZFS, it's very tempting to use a ZVOL as disk for a guest. Uh, because it uh, offers better so once you have it in that format and don't have to interface with mm -hmm. other formats. It's operationally easier, it can be faster, and it keeps the code simpler. Uh, basically, QCode2 is a user space solution to missing features in the Linux kernel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, even be yeah, from features super early on need you know, 4KVM. Go ahead. User space. Um, but one possible solution to do it outside of Beehive would be to write a geom similar to the MD uh, one in FreeBSD, which just does the translation. I might I might want to point out that somebody said that KCOW2 was an industry standard format. It's kind of odd that VMware's products don't seem to support it at all. Mm, so I, I doubt this... A... I doubt that that's really a correct statement that it's an industry standard. It's a Linux it's one standard. Industry standard. It's a Linux standard. Well, and it goes no further. Super quick more... question, Martin. Uh, uh, Santiago. So do, do these vendors also have VMware images? Yes, they do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so between well, the two. A, a VMware image is a raw flop. Files, or are you talking about OVAs? Okay, I'm guessing. Um, it can be a, a bit more than that, and Virtual Box has its own format again. This is true, but some of them are easy to convert because you only have to convert the metadata. Others can be a lot more complex because they have copy and write snapshotting, compression, and logical volume management in there. So, which subset of the QCO, so which stands for QEMO copy on write file format, uh, do you want to support? And to your point, yes, we get the snapshots it delivered in a kind of hokey way long ago. We get the copy on write. So yeah, in a 
uh, ZFS environment, it's it's we can you know, uh, the users roll their eyes. But I totally get that. You know, there could be warranty issues. I'm trying be, to find uh, the UPB code that I'm pretty sure is abandoned. But if someone wants to give it some love and, and take a look, they they did indeed have specifically a a project to bring in that support. So let's let's bring that to the top here. Here we go. The libvdsk. And I see even mention of your GNOP idea, Jan, about... Not, not GNOP, uh, MD. To do... To, you mentioned GEOM as a potential yes. shim. It would be but, which uh, component? So right now we have the GEOM-based uh, MD. So basically GEOM memory disks. Oh, MD. Yeah, okay. Yep. MD, uh, which can uh, expose a file as a GEOM provider. So yep. file to disk, basically. And there is a read-only compressed one, GANZIP, uh, which does okay. support more formats than just zip. It also supports LZ4 and ZSDD in recent releases, uh, which is useful for read-only images. Can even be used for a read-only root system on a deeply embedded system or something. Uh, but these tools aren't read right. And that's what's probably required. This would be an easy way to make this feature universally available and not put a special case into Beehive. Um, you wouldn't, in that case, have a just point Beehive at the uh, Geom provider created by such a Geom class. To okay. that, go, uh, to that point briefly, I, uh, the fact that say, I think LibArchive can support an a, an ISO image and simply transparently handle it is quite cool. And I do see how, regardless of Beehive, in a free BSD context, it might be nice to to just open up any of those formats. Uh, and I did post the link mm -hmm. to the previous UP, the UPB code on this topic that hasn't been touched in two years, but there's the effort to do it. And they've included VMDK support. So go ahead. That's good. But let's see VMDK. Mm. Yeah, three years ago, added support for VMDK. And I think, Michael, the last topic was um, while monitoring, yes. you know, the, those documents that you started creating to, to document how to set up things and those, 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 type of, those topics. I think something we are missing, or at least is not, I don't know, publicly documented, is if there are any counters that we should monitor for the virtual machines. Um, I don't know, something, any counter that you think, hey, yeah, just take, take a look on this, on that. I don't know. Uh, of course, we just monitor the normal things on the host and then on the guest. But I don't know if there is something specific that you recommend. Uh, more for, I don't know, memory, CPU, I.O., and those kind of things. So, yeah, mm -hmm. one, I think it's what, uh, uh, Beehive CTL could, could give various counters like VM exits, but in... Peter's own words they aren't super useful unless, of course, you're maybe comparing the different potential time counters and just making sure, hey, we've, or networking where we found a way to get more bang for the buck per operation and exit. Um, Santiago, am I assuming that you're interested yes. in monitoring production systems in production to just keep ahead of any potential degradations? Yes, yes. I had specifically issues with one one vendor that was complaining mm -hmm. about Beehive. And of course I was monitoring, you know, the normal things or, or standard and I was I was seeing that everything was okay. Uh but so, at the end I had to move the, the VMs to another machine just to prove that was not Beehive. So but I didn't have the tools to show them or the knowledge. They had to show them that hey, this is not because of Beehive. 
the cheap way uh, to answer that would be yes, D-Trace, but um, more realistic, what you probably want to look at is the uh, storage queue length and latency. That and, will be um, good, yeah. That basically what uh, GSTAT gives you if you filter for the right device. But GSTAT is an interactive tool. Um, it tells you for the category of read, write, and if you enable it, uh, delete. So unmapping uh, sparse storage in the context of a Beehive. Uh, the QDAP, operations per second throughput, and uh, most especially the latency uh, per read, per write, per unmap over the last inter polling interval, normally once a second or twice a second, I don't remember exactly. Mm. And you can, you would want to have something like this, probably not with that high of a poll rate. And the other thing you may want to look into is uh, VM exit or page faults. Is, the, is my CPU stuck on IO or is it stuck uh, in the virtual memory path? Yeah. Because those are the two most common ways you find out that your system feels slow, but the CPU isn't maxed out. And normally it's one of those two things, either it's waiting on slow storage or it's stuck at crashing the memory. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. It may be possible to do that with net data, which is already available as a port. Okay, yeah. So the net data port. Yeah, uh, yeah. or Prometheus, a, something like that to export, not exporter, yeah, to get some data. Mm -hmm. Or you yeah. write your own Prometheus exporter if there isn't something yeah. close enough. Yeah, yeah, that will work. Yeah. So, okay. so go ahead. Are you running with the memory wired? Yes. That helps. In that case, you don't really have to worry so much about the host memory side of things. Because yeah. once the okay. memory is wired down. And that's I actually you're left to with normal things like network monitoring. Something else which often came up uh, in this uh, talk is make sure if you're using ZFS that uh, you're not caching the block devices on the guest and the host because every guest assumes that it's a normal operating system so it will have its own uh, buffer cache and mm -hmm. if you put your backing storage on something like a ZVOL or a file in a ZFS file system, you will suffer from double buffering where <coughs> the guest tries to cache the block and ZFS caches the block. And the solution I prefer for this is to instruct the host to only cache the ZVOL metadata. Yeah. So that it, where your blocks are in your Z, ZFS pool, but it doesn't track their content. Hmm. And so this Basically, every time the Z wall is accessed, the metadata is cached and you're directly accessing the disk, which is what an operating system should assume. And, yeah. and it works well for me, but if you have a particularly stupid guest operating system, in that case, you may want to size down the uh, operating system cache as small as possible and let ZFS handle it. But in that case, your cache is on the other side of the uh, power virtualized disk IO boundary, which is slower than caching inside the guest. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure for these VMs, the, uh, well, or, or those pools, we have only metadata on the cache on the caching. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, also the appliances or the systems that they were running was uh, they were just piling crap on top. So yeah. Um, but my issue something I else, uh, them, which is it was not a bit unsatisfactory but still a relevant problem is that once uh, your users are spoiled because you provide them better than the um, established SLA service, they come to expect this service. 
And once uh, your system gets loaded to capacity and they fall down to the agreed upon SLA, they no longer agree to the SLA <laughs> and want to have instant access to lots of fast storage, for example, or plenty of CPU cycles. And in that case, you may have to do things like what you're already doing, wiring them down to the exact memory instead of over committing your memory. And at worst, you have to apply resource limits to the Beehive process and limit its uh, requests per second to the file system and so on to basically shape them down to the agreed upon performance all the time. Okay, okay. Thanks for that. I've mm. thrown some things in chat there and I'm looking yeah. for one careful, more that's like uh, if you're going down that something. route. Go ahead. And avoid using the uh, percent of CPU throttling because that's implemented as through the scheduler. And so basically once a process has exceeded its quota, it gets throttled at a two cost granularity and it feels jittery and slow even though it's not really loaded, but as soon as you come close to your capacity, suddenly you stop feeling nice and interactive instead of a guest or any other process running against those limits. Instead, it's better to use uh, either pinned uh, vCPU threads or um, restricting Beehive to some CPU set and let the scheduler do the normal scheduling instead of basically throwing a wrench into the way the scheduler is supposed to work. Yeah, got you. Yeah, yeah thanks. And I think maybe that or something, Z, it's like stat with a Z, uh, something, uh, I'm looking it up. But anyway, uh, there is the G-RS, which gives more information, perhaps with uh, Z vols, et cetera. And then Alan Jude pointed me to these case stats where it's not the most user friendly, but if you get the object set ID of a particular data set, you can then go read its counters. And if you have 20 of them and you run the math and it was this utility uses it, oh gosh, I'm trying to find that. I think that you can then see which of your data sets or Zvols is guilty for the most traffic, which is stunningly cool. Ztop, that might be it. Yeah, um, yeah, I remember Alan mentioning that. Yeah, but those yeah. are uh, interactive tools, uh, which are useful for debugging a working system, but not for establishing trends and establishing a baseline of a well working system. So autocorrect. Yes, ZTOP would appear to be it. It just gives me all my data sets with a. Z stat, a G stat like interface, but then there was one for Linux. If you happen to have that, was like that or something in Python. So anyway, yes, uh, Z top, very cool. Um, yes, stop. Yeah, stop is. <laughs> it won't let me type it. So auto corrected. Anyway, cool. Uh, and I'll put that in the note. Note Z top. Okay, uh, Santiago, does that give you adequate homework to experiment with? As and, usual, yes. Okay, yeah. and I, I totally see how something like uh, M, uh, bah, bah, bah. oh, here it is. I was that I, I did have it. It was off the screen, so I'll put that in there. Um, uh, MD config dash f q cow would be kind of cool. Even and it's not Beehive specific, but yes, you can then aim the resulting device at Beehive. So, um, so I'll put those so, in the notes there, and someone's welcome to throw in the the links for but, fresh points. Go ahead, Jan. If I remember correctly, one of the not supposedly nice features about uh, QCO two is that it has snapshotting support with copy on write semantics. I've <laughs> um, so it's. From a head of S operational point of view, okay, it's reinventing the wheel, but it's supposed to t work on other file systems as well, uh, which is relevant for everyone, but basically this uh, crew here. 
Yeah, um, ex yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, agreed um, there. Um, so it maybe it would be a, the idea would be to have uh, one uh, geom for the QCO two archive and then an one read only per snapshot exposed or something like that. And then you could easily work with it for, with any tool. But again, the problem is that if it's implemented at the geom layer, you, only the super user can do it unless you really want to uh, open up the security. Sure. Uh, Santiago, uh, for a VNC crash, not rashes, crashes, uh, does the client crash or the Beehive firmware the, take the VM the with server. it? Or what? Yeah, the, the server side, yeah. But server side, oh, that's that's an issue. Oh. And are there any tickets reported? Um, I haven't created any, but um, I didn't have too much time to test but these, these two months, but I know that, um, yeah, they open a client, and if the connection is bad, there are packet loss or whatever, it needs to do scaling or lower the resolution. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the shouting. That's OK. Um, yeah, the kids. Um, yeah, at that point, it disconnects, and then you cannot connect anymore until you destroy the VM and start it again. Yeah. So yeah. I guess it's on the server side, yeah. That doesn't sound good. Yeah, it should survive that. Um... It should enable reconnection. I think it's limited by design to one connection at a time, but it should be possible to replace the connection with a new, a new one. The next authenticated connection should just kick out whoever is still in there. Yeah. It's like um, you connect, it shows some garbage, like it shows That's something but of... corrupt and then it dies. Okay, the something but corrupted is kind of expected with VNC because uh, the, it works by back referencing content which isn't known uh, to the mm. new client. Okay, but it and then it get yeah. cleaned up over time. So the new client would uh, should just do something to change the output, and then over time, over a few seconds of changes, like clear the screen. Uh, one okay. thing to produce lots of output and then it should or just wiggle a window left to right and over time it should just yeah fix. so this is like once you connect you connect it like you start the vm yeah you connect mm -hmm. it opens it creates some garbage boom it closes, and then you cannot connect anymore you need to power off the vm uh and then start it again and in that but case does if the you set the, have uh, does the Beehive guest keep on running or does the Beehive... Yeah, yeah, it keeps well? running, yeah. It keeps but running, you yeah. Can, do you know if you can still establish a TCP connection to the Beehive VNC server and it's a client which refuses to deal with whatever the server produces or if uh, the server doesn't even connect, uh, accept the new connection anymore? I will check. I will double check that for you. Um, Neither is because, acceptable, yeah. but... Um, it helps. No, he, he, it times out when it tries. I'm pretty sure he was saying that it times out, like it cannot okay. open. Yeah. Um, but I will confirm that, you know. Please uh, submit a bug report for this. Okay. Roger. Take a that? look on the, on, the, um, on the server side. Take a look at the output of a TCP drop dash A dash L and see if you can find a lingering socket still connected to the VNC servers. And if so, drop that socket with TCP drop and then try to mm -hmm. reconnect. That should reset the VNC server side. VNC should actually at startup never send garbage. It should send a full frame, which is the reference frame that you get when you start yeah. any VNC session. So if we're sending, if if it almost sounds like you're ending up in a half connected socket getting reconnected somehow, which is a TCP bug, but mm. um, I would look very carefully once you get once you disconnect the client, look and make sure that the server side is not still in an established state. Look for that okay. socket to the server. Okay. And if you see if you see that the server is still in an established it has an established socket, 
use TCP drop to drop it, okay. which should clean up the server side and then see if you can reconnect because it, okay. this won't, this won't fix the problem. It's a workaround and it yeah, helps yeah. provide additional data about what might be going on. Yeah. But it's a, um, it's this, a, this issue only happens with, when we are using auto detection, you know, for the compression, the protocol, etc. If we put it manually, I think they did some test and they found the combination that it just works. Uh, but if you put it in automatically, it then yeah. crashed. I remember yeah. there were some bug reports a while ago uh, about uh, the dynamic uh, bandwidth uh, adoption. Yeah. And if a client hardwires the bitrate to some combination, it works. In this case, it was triggered by uh, unreliable uplink connections to the server. I'm still of the opinion that the Beehive VNC server should only be used to install your guest far enough to have it host its own uh, remote access protocol, either mm. SSH or VNC or RDP or whatever. Uh, for Windows Virtual Machines, we included RDP server, provides a lot better experience than the uh, Beehive VNC server. Yeah. Yeah, this is usually when they are deploying like a Red Hat and they use a graphical installer or something like that. So the, so that the, the OS is not even... Yeah. And if it doesn't work, it's just a bad experience. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I will try to find more information and put it, yeah, put in a document and share it. Excellent. Appreciate it. Uh, Brian V, anything to share or questions? Something else uh, to try if it's a non-trivial network uh, path from the uh, VNC client to servers to look into TCP, uh, keep your lives. So uh, don't get me wrong, connection. you could use dummy net to dirty your connection to it. No, no, the other way around to okay. have TCP detect uh, hung connections and kill the socket. Hmm. But it doesn't, it sounds like a problem on both sides because neither the server should behave that way nor should the client react that way. But the end result uh, are frustrated users who get a bad impression of Beehive. Yep. So That's correct. Right. Yeah. Please try to find a reproducer, but even without document what you can and send in a bug report. Okay, we'll do. Otherwise, these problems only get mentioned every few months in small groups and don't get fixed or get you get duplicated work and... Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. And patches yeah. die in some fork GitHub repository. <laughs> like you can't yeah. do support, but I'm fine. <laughs> anyway... Uh, Brian V, just to beat up on you, anything you've got? Questions or thoughts? Yeah, nothing for today. Cool. So jump in with your appropriate topics, but uh, 11, let's see, 13.2 has hit slush or mush or whatever form of early release candidate such that now is a really good time to test features, and it sounds like John had a chance to test his vCPU work on AMD with it, so that's a great thing. But uh, like you've just mentioned, while the firmware is a bit orthogonal, let's test VNC under 13.2. What else do people have as priorities? Jan, I don't think Mav MFC'd his CTL work because it's too dramatic a change, but it's in current. Uh, his changes can't just be MFC because they break the CTL yep. slash cam ADI. Which is fine. He had to uh, increase reasonable. the struct size and that to ca because he d instead of uh, fixing only the bug report I reported, he also uh, bumped the uh, SCSI command tag size from 32 to 64 bits because that's what the latest specification allows. And yep. 
it's nice if we have it now, basically. It would be nice, but that aside, uh, you know, compared ahead. to uh, if Cam and CTL had to break the ABI when it becomes relevant for general use somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. So does this group have top concerns, nagging issues that just we can't get wrong in this release within the confines of things like the CTL not being MFCable, changes being MFCable? I'm having issues with Broadcom drivers with what is going to be 13.2. I reported that in Baxilla, also sent emails to current oh, yeah. uh, and nothing. Can we? It's, yeah. Can we? Completely broke. Do you have that? Uh, we talked about this in some private channels. Do you have that yeah. link handy for the report and the commit that you suspect is to blame? Ye yeah. I, uh, yeah. Um, and naturally, the moment you sent that, I, I jumped on a box that had that interface and i'm like oh no please yes stay working yes. please yes yes yes, yes. Um, um i don't have it here because i'm with the phone but i will sure. send it to you after the meeting uh, oh, for sure. yeah and I, I i think i can grab it off my phone ironically so uh the broadcom issues while it's a bit is there anything beehive specific such as uh about the vtd iommu based pass through mm. and such or is it just in general Sorry, for the driver, you mean? Or? Yeah, for the driver, if it, like with these no, network general, cards, if just, you're passing them through to a VM, are they problematic or is it just in general? They're no, it's just in general. You just cannot in general. Okay. Use, use the interface, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I That's... found your commit. I'll try to put it somewhere. Yeah. I mean, what I did is just revert that specific one that is the addition for the VLAN for the Tor um, ASIC. But I, I think I'm. I will try to see if I can find what the, the specific issue is. Okay. Sorry, my skills on C are not good, guys. So I can I know that that's the the, the commit that broke it, but I don't know which line. Uh, I will paste it. Boom. So I, go ahead and confirm in the chat if that's the. Uh, Let me check. One second. Yep. Exactly that one. Okay. Is, yeah. Exactly. And then yeah. I think you had a PR to go with it. Let me see. Yes, that's correct. There is a PR. Oh, reviews. Here we go. It's revision. Okay. So log in. Maybe it is D3644. Ah. Uh, Okay, other hot topics. What do you just sincerely want to get right? Uh, that does not look like it. Um, uh, ah. So this looks like yours. And yeah, it's it's not hardware you find um, just about everywhere. Okay, so uh, if that's a conversation to date, it's in there and let's hope that gets some attention. Uh, Corvin, is your organization targeting 13.2? Yes, and uh, we already did a rebase and some tests and haven't found any issues yet. And at the moment, we are waiting for um, yeah, the first release candidate so we can rebase again on the first um, yeah 13.2 release. Okay. Oh, how far are you from simply upstream FreeBSD? Is that a goal with your product? 
you've been fantastic about upstreaming. Um, can you briefly characterize yes, just how so, much you have to change? Um, yeah, it is a big, bigger stack, but uh, yeah, we're trying to upstream edge mass as much as possible. Awesome. So our goal is that we just use the upstream uh, FreeBSD and change some configuration files, and then we have our system. Okay, and then the do you have to go as far as say a kernel module of your own, or are you completely off the using off the shelf FreeBSD? No, so for our uh, yeah real time um, um, execution, we have an own kernel module. Oh, okay, um, cool. Which we load, um, but the rest of the FreeBSD system should be as close as possible to upstream. Which isn't always possible because sometimes we have some uh, to make some patches to FreeBSD, uh, which doesn't make sense in upstream just mm -hmm. for our return requirements. Sure. But um, yeah, we try to keep this as less as possible. That's great. Hey, that's that's what it looks like. Nicely done. Uh, well, we're at 50 minutes in. Any other topics, questions, ideas? Um, yep. Yeah, if you have any spare hardware, please spin up 11, the, the 13, I keep saying 11, the 13 to uh, early releases. And there was a, a vocal point made that please test the actual installers rather than just FreeBSD update because those from time to time have issues. Um, even I even found just yesterday that much to my surprise, a memstick installer is not working on a Dell R 730 or 630, which Rodney, maybe you have some insights on that, but I thought, Oh, that's clearly that works. I use the ISO through the IDRAC all the time, but um, oops, what the heck didn't like it. Jan, I see your comment about the 710. Let me share you a lovely comment that I found just two days ago. About the quality of this particular chip? That is exactly it. Let me oh, share yes. that. I'll I'm let the group well decide that for the with, um, broader discussion. Dedicated hardware to uh, faster <laughs> firmware coprocessor. Yeah, the headline, I, uh, it might not be a bit orthogonal to the doc, but uh, the Intel X710 NICs are crap, is the headline. So so there's that. And it's a well-justified rant, but look at the date. Okay. The uh, firmware bugs have been mostly resolved. Um. Uh, so I hope to be replacing one with an older chip on uh, tomorrow, Friday, because we just can't get the thing to work. And at best for me, a quad port card gives just an, a, a notification, I won't say error, but a message on FreeBSD constantly, even though it's working. And it's just like, come on, that lightning is striking too often with those cards in my book. So I even have the even uh, drip, I even have the older chip set here around uh, in my home lab. Because... Yeah. And in my workstation, I even have an old Connect X2 card because okay. the box is so inefficient that throwing another 10 watts at, or 15 at the network card doesn't hurt. Um, but the problem with those older uh, X2, uh, X520 cards and so on is that they don't have all that many rings to go around in hardware. So even if you get them working, you can only get a few fast virtual machines out of them hmm. because otherwise you're down to one queue per VM quickly and then performance isn't that good. But for a lot of time, your uh, X520 was vastly preferable. I haven't had to use the X710 a lot, but uh, I know that it's common on some main boards as mm -hmm. onboard, good enough onboard NIC. Mm. Well, you're not wrong. Anyway, other topics, ideas, questions, concerns, funny jokes. Ooh, uh, we 
I might mute it out, but uh, we spoke briefly of a vaccine and the comment was, you know, many top scientists are on the autism spectrum. So the response was, so you're saying autism technically causes vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that made my day. It's like, well, someone's thinking. I like it. Thinking is good. Anyhow, uh, without further ado, if you don't have anything, I say we all get back to work. Oh, my gosh. My to-do list is like an inch thick, but I'm just uh, weird. By the way, uh, the base system G start, the non Rust version, um, does include a batch mode which can be configured to output in CSV, which should be easy co to consume if you don't want to uh, deal with Geom directly and prefer parsing some easy to parse CSV output from STD in. If you're looking for something like an IO latency and throughput uh, calculator to feed into your time series database. Jan, is that full LibXO and you can just make it JSON, make it whatever you want? Uh, or just I don't CSV? think so. Let me ch check uh, what it links against. Oh, man. Uh, uh, it that. doesn't link uh, against... Uh, it, it links against libbsd XML, but that's probably for parsing the XML representation of the geom uh, graph. Oh, no. ca dash capital C for CSV output. So yeah, it's pretty specific, but that's okay. It's better than nothing. CSV <laughs> can be easy. You, I don't expect you will have much quoting problems with uh, your geom disk names. And everything else is numeric. Yep, 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 yep. But feel free to drop in libxo and submit a patch. Yeah, no kidding. We really, Which... just like, there would probably be little um, problem um, adding libucl parsing to more base system utilities, but nobody wants to do the mind-numbing work of regression testing, all the crux yeah. of existing output formats, because yes. someone has written a parser for it. And it's Somehow probably... I assumed it's there. Go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, the Raspberry Write is nice for interactive use because you can have, mu on a big screen, you can have multiple columns and can filter and pause. Indeed. Well, gang, we're at 9.57. How about we call it there? I'll be around a few minutes, sure. and I wish you a fantastic remainder of the week. Thanks. You are welcome. So glad you made it. Welcome, Brian, with some of our less frequent attendees. Corbin, take <laughs> care. Jan, always a pleasure. Andrew, hang in there. Bye, or. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Have a good day. I was all. actually going to take a look and see what 10 gig cards we were that we were using. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Drop me a line. So over time, especially by dot zero releases, I've been bitten multiple times by some annoying regression around link aggregation or bridging and VLAN combined. There are some yeah. offloading feature had to be disabled because... Otherwise, the bridge wouldn't see the tech packets or. Yeah. I know Jason Tubner had plenty of issues in 12 with a mix of, of offloading and bridging. And yeah, I got to test all the things. Go ahead. On our uh, file server, we're using, uh, I believe I'm not completely sure on this. I think we're using a 500 X 500 series. And then the actual on the VMware side for, cause it's for our VMware environment. Uh, it actually has X 710s built on the board. So uh, yeah. not having mm -hmm. a problem though. Knock on wood. My theory was but Windows and VMware, VMware might be the first class clients. Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, exactly. 
if you're using VMware, someone uh, has done it for you. <laughs> well, the the article you linked was specifically complaining about it on VMware. Which is why I said, look at the date code. Yeah. yeah. It's Which a valid fair. brand, but it's also a chip from five years ago, at least. And at this point, it seems to be working fairly reasonably, I guess is my mm -hmm. point. At this point, it seems to be working fairly reasonably, is my point. Mm -hmm. Can't argue with that. And, At least for what well, we're um, using it for. Regarding LLDP and interesting behavior, I've shot myself in the foot on my OpenBSD routers, but it isn't OpenBSD specific. By enabling LLDP uh, on the base interfaces of a failover um, trunk and... What happens is that the operating system, OpenBSD and FreeBSD both, would reconfigure both or two or more members of the uh, an OpenBSD trunk on FreeBSD lag interface uh, to the same MAC address. And so they would start sending out the LLDP announcements uh, with the same MAC address. And if you have two switches, which lack multi-chassis uh, link aggregation support, so I had to do it statically, then you get your MAC address bumping between ports uh, on different switches, and you get every few seconds, a few seconds uh, traffic loss. <laughs> yeah. Then, well, that's not because, good. Exactly, because the uh, operating system, now this is the wrong part, I'm not taking it, and you're getting asymmetric traffic flow and Ethernet really doesn't like that. So LLDP and uh, link aggregation can interact in interesting ways. And you said failover as in simply lag uh, or carp? Lag in failover mode. Okay. Um, which is what you have to do if you want uh, basically first hop redundancy on the Ethernet in a layer two network with no routing and so on, because uh, cheaper switches uh, lack uh, multi-chassis link aggregation support. Yep. And if you have multi-chassis link aggregation support in production, you will find out that even most vendors who claim to support it uh, have interesting corner cases in split brain mm. situations. So, for example, I've seen HP uh, break in a way, it really mind-bogglingly bad way where the if the control plane dies there's no uh, keep alive watchdog in the data plane and the data plane would keep on forwarding on a with a crashed control plane mm. and if your primary control plane crashes the backup would take over couldn't reach the other data plane through the other control plane and so you would have two forwarding uh, data planes uh, closing loop Hmm. Interesting. Uh, the stack wouldn't even complain all that loudly about failing over. And yeah, it took down the whole site Goodness. because this was just blasting 20 gigabits of uh, multicast traffic in a loop. <laughs> and then the, uh, all of which ports just blinking in sync as a Christmas tree, the activity. <laughs> uh, running at full line rate, it would... And there was enough unicast traffic in, mixed in there to, even with um, multicast and uh, broadcast rate limits, it still took everything down. Are you using Mac movement notification on the uh, on those switches? I, don't I know was seeing nothing because not the remote logging wasn't even able to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> because okay. it, the, the network was totally yeah. saturated with the yeah. uh, exponential <laughs> copies of the loop packets. <laughs> we took down other things or we kept them rebooting and so on. Uh, you did, didn't really know where to start debugging, and of course yeah. the soft messages were lost as well. Yeah. And so you said it was in OpenBSD, right? Uh, OpenBSD was innocent. Oh, uh, it was innocent. 
Uh, OpenBSD, the pro only problem was that the third party LLDP announcer I installed an OpenBSD L uh, ah, gotcha. was I configured it on the faces directly mm. yeah. uh, to get notifications on all ports and not just the master port of the failover. But FreeBSD or other operating systems would behave the same way. The problem is that basically for efficiency reasons, if you add interfaces to a failover or other kind of link aggregation, logically on an Ethernet layer, it's one link. And this link gets one MAC address. And so it reconfigures the active native MAC address of the uh, NIC. So suddenly you have multiple NICs with the same MAC address on purpose. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And the switch doesn't know. Other things you can find out is what's really interesting is if you uh, put build a bridge of VLAN interfaces because you only want to bridge certain VLANs and then enable a rapid spanning tree on this bridge because then you get a tagged rapid spanning tree frames yeah. instead of rapid spanning tree uh, with a VLAN tag inside spanning tree packet uh, frame, you get a tagged frame with spanning tree in it, which switch vendors really don't agree on how to treat it. From <laughs> just ignore it to uh, disable this port to uh, <laughs> translate it somehow and treat, treat it as a if it applied to all VLANs on this port. Yeah. So uh, it's a mess. Yeah. At least it used to be. Uh, um, but it's, you're not supposed to produce this kind of uh, spanning tree frame anyway. So uh, do you blame OpenBSD for allowing you to configure this or FreeBSD? And some vendors even do, do what you intend to do with it. So and it's really unspecified what's supposed to happen in that case. So yeah. The best solution is still just accept it and uh, it, don't try to solve these problems on layer two. Go layer three and- Layer three, yeah. Yeah. And starting with FreeBSD 13, we finally have the infrastructure for proper multipath routing, even if the routing demands are not there yet to make it easy. Have you done any VXLAN testing on VSC or FreeVSC or? I've used VXLAN, uh, it works, but the performance isn't amazing. Okay. So how, how uh, bad it is? But do you remember? Uh, on a on a not very fast uh, CPU, if, because it didn't do proper multi-threading, I think it was like seven gigabits or so. With, okay. Um, but it wasn't really uh, taxing all the systems. I don't know which side was the bottleneck. So I didn't do proper testing. I just made sure that it was an option. Okay. And it okay. would have no, been because good. for the setup I was looking on, at for a hacker space, it was still a gigabit network, so it would have been fine. Uh, basically, I just wanted to know whether it works. I don't know if FreeBSD even supports uh, VXLAN acceleration, which is available in some NICs. Oh, interesting. In pure, yeah. one of the problems with uh, using GRE is that GRE is a its own layer three protocol and isn't wrapped in uh, UDP. So it doesn't uh, provide any bits to the uh, hash function for hashing your uh, encapsulated traffic to multiple network uh, queues. Uh, so by default, almost all NICs uh, drop all GIE uh, packets into the first queue. And so you have a all your encapsulated traffic, if you're using JE, goes to the first queue. Whereas with, while UDP in theory is less 
efficient VXLAN can be faster in reality because each UDP uh, flow gets its gets its own chance to pick a um, receive or transmit queue. Hmm. Yeah. So network yeah. cards are only optimized for offloading and so UDP and mostly TCP. Hmm. So depending on which silicon you have, there may be some silicon out there which can, for example, pick out the GRE key or something like that to pick it. Or to in theory, it, yeah. it could at least pick the uh, source and destination IP address. But what I've seen is that uh, at least the Intel and the um, Mellanox cards just threw it all into the uh, mm -hmm. first uh, receive ring upon reception. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, well, and those are the ones. Thread, one thread in the. Sorry. Go ahead. And then you only make use of one CPU core for uh, decapsulating all the tunneled mm. uh, frames. Go ahead, Andrew. And I have a question was, for you, Santiago. Uh, I was going to say those. Um, those are the cards that I would expect to behave the best. I mean. Doing things uh, fast. The newest one, it was just an uh, old X2, so it's older than dirt, but. Mm, okay. I yeah, also it have. possible uh, on newer cards, it's just that I didn't find any knob to turn. Okay. Uh, Andrew, if you don't have some. Thing. Santiago, are you doing anything with ON switches, open networking? Because I see Pika 8 came up as like something with the XLAN acceleration. Uh, open, so open switches, you mean like disaggregation of networking? Uh, like there is soft... like Sonic and Pika 8. Yes. And, yeah. you know, in theory, a f air quotes free operating system for your switch that yeah, in theory exactly. built but then all, anything you actually need is hiding behind a vendor page or a very large level yeah. of money and all that just any well, experiences there yeah we we do a lot with we are working with a few vendors yeah um, because yeah some tel some big telcos in europe are, are requiring it uh to be honest there is only one vendor that is making a difference the other ones are just trying to replace juniper and cisco and, and it will not happen it's more expensive. The software is shit. Sorry for the bad word. Um, so the experience is not really good, to be honest. Um, there, there is only one. If you want to to see, take a look. It's DriveNet. Um, they are doing some interesting bits. They are, um, and and they support multiple white boxes. Um, uh DriveNets.com? Uh, I think so. Or, or Net. Yeah. They, they mention cloud a whole lot, but yeah. my boxes, there you go. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I th we, we will have a few of them in the lab in two weeks' time. So if you want to play with them or if we want me to do like a quick demo, I can show you. But again, these ones are the only ones that are like bringing something new into the industry. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, there there's just this weird hollow promise that you can either build the control plane and install it or build the OS and install it just like we do with mm -hmm. any of our other servers. Yeah. And when it comes to time to actually do it, it's like, no, not exactly. really. That was kind of a, yeah. a promise by who uh, knows who with their paper. It was an idle promise. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because... Um... So the problem is that basically that NVIDIA bought up a certain vendor. <laughs> yeah. And mm. and promptly in the next release dropped support for all non-NVIDIA silicon. Because for legal reasons they didn't want to know uh, have their developers know about anything uh, from other vendors. Because there could be some licensing and patent problem. Mm. Okay. which is a convenient excuse to rip out that which was already working. Mm. Yeah. It's also weird that then Intel killed the Tofino, so <laughs> now uh, we have Intel, less options. Um, killed a lot of stuff, 
and it's going yeah. to kill a lot of stuff right now because so, uh, they are really um, in trouble, I think. Is they the are. GPU happening or not? Can't tell. The um, GPU is The ones happening. that were made exist. Oh, that's, there that's cool. There is serious question as to what will continue. The AXG group has been split amongst other departments. I see. Uh, AXG is the uh, GPU team? Yes. Sorry. And the other thing is, but the GPU driver development was very active as of a few weeks ago. Yeah, they actually just put out a very impressive new driver hmm. where, so, for instance, uh, uh, I was actually just talking to somebody else about it. Um, their DX9 support, they increased performance by like 25%. Oh, hello. Hmm. In some examples, what? even 70% plus, but hmm. that, that just shows how much overhead there was in their existing support by translating it to direct x11 and... oh they're still doing that they just pulled in exactly and an it's not outside even a bad idea. gp or outside uh open source project solution for doing it and they're just translating dx9 to uh vulcan i think hmm. uh, it's uh, the vulcan, the soft okay. well the software they they got it that, that they're kind of borrowing was is designed for running games in linux it's the same thing okay. they use it's the same thing they use that uh valve uses for the, so the molten or no the molten is the from I, I, right? I'm, I'm not yeah, that what's the name um... yeah i'm not that knowledgeable um... i just know what i've been reading about what they you know what they did mm -hmm. and how it works DXVK is a tool for uh, trans is a translation layer from direct 3D to um, Vulkan. Most that might be it then. The direct 3, 9 and 11, but because mm. what they needed to do is they needed to get it to one of the you know more modern mm -hmm. pro, uh, um, APIs that the card actually supports. So Vulkan or DX12. Mm -hmm. Which is fine because these functions are, there are very few functions you would actually miss in those APIs, which have to be in hardware because those games are old enough that having like 10% driver overhead is totally acceptable. What's not acceptable is that they had lots of jitter. Yeah. I think when recompiling the shaders generated to replace old fixed function hardware yeah they yeah what was going on is even a few games the average frame rate would decrease but the frame time differences yeah or uh pulled more so much more consistently that it's a better experience okay and we're because talking what about people uh, real what people really notice is when you go from like having, you know, one or two frames that double your frame time. That's... One or two frames with double frame time at the frame rates achievable by those cards wouldn't even be totally unacceptable. Just a uh, work in progress. The problem was that for some games, uh, the reviews I've seen indicate that they had spikes to ridiculous levels with frame times up to 160 milliseconds uh, for a single frame, and then it would come back and rock yeah. uh, again. So trading one or two percent, which is the regression we're talking about in some cases, uh, for an across the board slight improvement of more than that uh, in, in average frame times and uh, very large uh, improvement in frame time consistency and worst case uh, frame times is definitely worth it, but I still wouldn't want to uh, use them for older games. But that's easy to say uh, once you've wasted your money on a 3090. <laughs> yeah, I haven't wasted my money on a 3090 and, you know, I'm actually considering one of them because yeah i happen to think both nvidia and 
even to a lesser degree, AMD is asking just stupid prices for stuff. Yeah, but I got mine just as the shortage was starting. Uh, I'd only fa paid 50 ah. euros above uh, MSRP for it. Uh, Back when MSRPs were reasonable. Yeah, exactly. Well, reasonably. Well, there w it was never a reasonably priced card by design, the 3090. At least not for uh, gaming. Yeah. Games. I yeah, wanted the, the 90s weren't. The 80s were. And it was already sold out. And uh, I said, fuck it. I can't travel this year anyway. So uh, let's spend the fun money. Um, but uh, even at this point, the 80 series stuff from NVIDIA is it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous money grab. Uh, because even if we, you take into account all the... Uh, um, problems they're having with yield rates and cost per area and stuff like this. The uh, product of area times cost per area is just in no relation to the um, so the, from the 30 to the 40 series, the cards got the silicon got uh, smaller by more than the uh, cost per area increased and still that try to increase the price just to increase margin. Which, well, is what the shareholders want, but uh, it's also a very short-term thinking solution to just milk the market for whatever you can get right now. Maybe well, to that they're destroying the market. What I'm hearing is that they, I mean, not that they have no margin whatsoever, but their margin is low enough. They've been squeezing all their vendors. I mean, that's why EVGA left yeah, the well, industry. Stop. I'm and... blaming NVIDIA, not NVIDIA's card producers right now. Yeah, that's yeah. I get the, that. The margin per GPU die, not the margin per card for the GPU OEM. Yeah, I get that. But I'm what I'm saying is, what I'm hearing is, even even NVIDIA's margin per GPU die has been low enough that they don't have enough to really be able to to push the cost down. And I mean, at, in, in the yeah, mid-range, the they're giving up. Gigabyte, uh, what was it? Was it a 4080 or wasn't it? Uh, yeah, that. And, that, I that, mean, was, come on. that was that was dumb. Chopping up the memory bus again. Haven't they learned from the 20 series that just chopping the memory bus... Uh, down to a neck to ridiculous levels relative to the compute performance doesn't produce good cards. Yeah, well, uh, but I think I think uh, the, the ATI side of things or ATI uh, yeah. AMD side of it's the same thing. The AMD side of things where they're going to, you know, a chiplet approach even for their GPUs but makes a lot the of sense. The opposite way of the server CPUs. If you look at the Fred Ripper or Epic, uh, they have the IOs slash cache die, so basically the uh, interface die in the middle, and the compute around, and instead the GPUs are built the other way around, with memory and cache dies around the compute die, and one uh, cache die per GPU memory channel which uh, is how you have to build it because of the ridiculous uh, internal bandwidth required yep. in a GPU. I, I was going to say the, the, the problem domains are very different between a general purpose GPU, a general purpose CPU and a GPU. And that's, yes. so they have to do them differently. And supposedly that's but... the reason why they're spending all their developer resources on getting good performance out of this design now, because the latency between the, uh, they are uh, level one and two caches in the uh, compute die in the middle and the cache dies has a bit increased. And so they have to ca change their cost function. Yeah. I, I, latency is, is the, tr the latency is involved in the trick with going oh. to that approach, but being able to decrease the size of the dies what has and do multiple dies the... is, is definitely from a cost perspective, much better. Um, 
Michael, uh, I don't have any problem if you want to post uh, the chat uh, notes. Oh, I mean the the extended discussion. <laughs> this year, quite good and civil. Actually, uh, I have a a more on topic question. I can, if I can interject very quickly. Of course. Uh, right now, I'm just. It's. I'm just. Um, <laughs> I am too. I, I know. I know what you're going to say. I am too. Um, okay. I actually specifically got asked uh, in the hallway while I'm pacing around. Um, what do we know about um, the various uh, CPU security bug type things like uh, Spectre and all of that and our vulnerabilities to it? How do we check that? Who is we? Beehive. Beehive. Um... Like I said, this one this one's actually on topic. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, there was a discussion with uh, John Baldwin last week on the developers call about uh, masking features and so on. Okay. Maybe, um, that's the only thing you can do is defensive design. Don't try to get the last corner case out of the hardware. At some point. Uh, the other thing is that it's by this point known that hyper-threading, while it can improve throughput in the current implementation compared to earlier ones, is not to be really trusted as a secure uh, side-channel-free uh, isolation. So okay. one thing, for example, can do as an operator is to uh, make sure when you're provisioning guests to uh, only allocate uh, whole cores and not just hyper threads to uh, a guest. If you leave hyper uh, threading enabled, which is very tempting on uh, a virtual machine server, uh, just give full both hyper threads of a core to uh, the same guest and don't schedule any other guest on the same CPU core. So basically statically partition your full CPU cores among guests. Okay. Gets rid of timing channels. Uh, if you're looking at things like Rohammer, there's not all that much you can do um, because you may be able at the firmware level on some boards to uh, increase the scrubbing rate of the back backgrounds uh, ECC scrubber. Okay. Or the kernel could be configured to do some kind of background software scrubbing to detect um, degrading ECC protected memory while it's still only a single bit error before some kind of uh, software exploit had the time to properly uh, hammer away at the memory long enough to exploit the what used to be called pattern uh, vulnerability and it used to be called defective SRAM uh, or DRAM if it had a pattern vulnerability hmm. but it's not anymore instead it's uncommon enough that it's well and what we are getting instead now is that even the DDR5 memory interface is so close to the limits of what's physically possible uh, that despite the memory not having ECC bits internally, uh, the um, DDR5 interface is always ECC enabled because uh, it's used to catch trans transmission errors now. Mm -hmm. because the memory bus is so cl close to just noise that <laughs> yeah that we're getting you're, you're getting noise and you have to correct it yeah but exactly and uh, which of course makes it tempting for vendors to cheat and put on a dummy die and <laughs> pretend it's ECC but mm. that's discouraging yeah because so 
there's not that much you can do. I think, I mean, okay, you could try to get some kind of gamer DDR RAMs or something for your workstation, which support a higher voltage and run it at a slightly increased voltage and reduce the timing so that it's less easy to run it out of, of its specification. But now you're basically doing the memory equivalent of uh, building co very special tinfoil hats. <laughs> it's, there's no proper research for this. And okay. The other thing is... Uh, yeah. I just got the question asked from my boss who... Mm -hmm. This is the rare occasion he happened to actually be in the hallway in the building. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so, but uh, what I would try, because of the lengthy pattern of uh, side channels, uh, sometimes even uh, in the case of the Skylake uh, generation, Zeons, uh, real state corruption between hyperthreads. Do you remember the uh, the bug in the uh, Skylake renamer? No. Uh, the Skylake Xeons have a bug in the renamer where if you don't have the right microcode uh, patch to uh, dis basically uh, pull the safety uh, chicken bits and stop it from making full use of the um, renamer, the, they had a bug in the, I uh, think, in the Zeering ide uh, idioms or the um, something similar. And what happens is if you have certain combinations of legacy features, for example, the OCaml runtime, and I think the GHC as well, made use of the aliasing between uh, the 16-bit halves of 32-bit registers in the runtime to get, because the old 16-bit uh, instructions have very short enco encodings, which give better code density, and you can avoid a few shift and mask instructions. And they use this for um, setting and clearing the garbage collector bits. And their code was correct, but the Skylake CPU didn't rename them correctly between hyperthreads. And so suddenly you could uh, sometimes write the upper 16 bits of a 32-bit register in the wrong hyperthread. So you would have data corruption in your registers. Hmm. And the thing is, it's really... That sounds almost impossible to deal with. Yeah, and the uh, if you install the microcode patches... Uh, available as support in FreeBSD, this is taken care of. At a, for most workloads, slight. For some workloads, really uh, painful, loss of performance, because uh, this uh, zeroing and uh, move elimination saved registers and broke dependency chains. So suddenly the renamer isn't able to see that, oh, this part, this uh, architecture level uh, register is now independent of all the previous instructions because if you have something like saw a register with itself or move the literal into it mm -hmm. and it no longer depends on anything else and it can get re a new rename slot and if you move to another register, you don't have to really move it. Instead, you can just increment the reference count to the uh, renamed register, basically, in, which is something modern CPUs are, in theory, capable of. And in the Skylake implementation, there was a silicon bug. And uh, if you have hyperthreading enabled, and the annoying part is if you install the microcode update, which is required for other bugs as well, uh, you lose this feature even if you disable hyperthreading. So the chicken bit is set unconditionally and doesn't depend on the hyperthreading state. 
a friend of mine working uh, on HPC code has ranted and raved about this because uh, this costs them like 15% floating point throughput and some well optimized. Um, and the only solution is to not up, uh, load any microcode patches for any bugs. Uh, Jan, is that the accurate article about the hyper-threading bug? Uh, which one? I played paste it in chat there. Uh, let's see. Uh... I have five chickens, but I didn't know I had chicken bits. <laughs> hey, then you're the only one that can afford to eat eggs. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> yeah. It's like, good timing. <laughs> it's like, sweet. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Looks about right. Um, regarding CPU performance, I'm really tempted to finally upgrade from Zen 2 to Zen 4 on my desktop because those AVX 512 gimmicks look tempting. <laughs> Is there a single vendor who has an, 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 an even a Threadripper system that's just predictable, available, consistent, or is uh, it also like gamer territory? Sorry, uh, Threadripper, and Thread, especially Threadripper Pro is for the workstation market. Yeah, and Epic, but it's just, where does one run out and buy such a CPU? As you the CPU, you the problem was that, that for, CPUs. no, you can well, right now. A solution, you a solution. See that, uh, that AMD was basically limiting them to a very few OEMs. The only one you could reasonably buy was Lenovo and fold them from arm and a leg. Yeah, that's, the, that's what I was going to say. The thing basically... is that uh, it may make sense, especially for you with the FreeBSD background and server background, to more or less look into um, larger than ATX Epic boards and high frequency medium core count epics if you want an affordable system which can take lots of extension cards because yeah. the difference between Threadripper and Epic is that yes, Threadripper is closer to the uh, consumer line in the way that it can be for example easily overclocked and boost, boost farther but if you have a high core count variant it's not that relevant anymore mm. because even the epics now boost close to what's possible. Yeah. And the other thing is what you lose is basically you have the chipset and Epic doesn't use a chipset, which actually reduces part costs for mainboard because this chipset is quite big, mm -hmm. and, but you don't want it for your real workstation unless you really depend on having a lot of USB ports on the main board and an analog audio and something like this. If I remember, uh, and put all of these, this stuff in there and it's not really something you need if you want to put in dedicated cards anyway and make use of lots of suitably spaced out eight and 16 lane slots. Fair enough. But if I'm after just the muscle, was it Lenovo that's delivering a predictable skew Lenovo, that I can run you... out and buy? What do you mean by predictable? Like I, I can, or I can you order can buy two it. of them. You well, can first off buy it. I can get two if I really want. You get the and then normal vendor there. crap in the workstation market, yeah, or business PC market yeah. of heavily customized special parts you can only get for this vendor for the support duration of this product exactly. and you don't want to pay the prices they're asking uh, if you haven't bought the um, most expensive warranty bullshit right it's li just like Dell, HP and any or Lenovo in this case with designing useless parts even if it's in the gamer side of things i've seen such nice rants from gamers nexus about yeah. alienware case design well, yeah well i we found basically the took station... a late 90s <sighs> case put it on a wretch and glued lots of plastic around it just so they could keep a 20 year old tower 
and then, then <laughs> they did crazy mechanical engineering to attach things to it. Yeah, uh, but that's, I mean, that's, I don't think that's what we're interested in. No, no, it's not. So not. I found a, a lovely uh, Amazon Think Station for a mere $9,000. No, like, really? The thing, those things are crazy expensive, but oh. we'll just see what's the CPU you want and mm. and what's your use case, basically. Anyway. Which socket are you looking for? Uh, I on paper, I want simply the Dell, what is it, 70 something 15 with the 7502P single socket chip because they are remarkably cheaper than most others. But yeah, but 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 they are few and far between, so it's not like they're falling off of trucks. Um, but uh, this at the moment, I would look for a Zen 4 based server CPU, the single socket variant, so P, and then. Yeah, yeah. You can buy those starting uh, at least I see them starting at oh that's painful but the thirty two core one starts at two thousand eight hundred yeah there you go exactly public market and you can go up to like eight thousand just for the uh, ninety six core variant but the sixty four one uh, I think it's a seven five five one P that was like okay you're looking a at lot less money than every other epic out there. Anyway, um, make sure it's not one of the so-called four channel optimized ones. Uh, the seven four, sorry, the seven what? Seven five one five P, I believe. Seven five five one P. We there's some variation on that. Uh, let's so, see. So here. the sixteen core one. Seven three one three P. Seven three one. No, with the, it's a five series. A so seven. Seven five five one P is a thirty two core. Yeah. Seven five four three P. Yeah, for two point uh, not m that much cheaper. Mm. Two point four K in Europe at least. In that case, I would probably go for Zen four for another four hundred euro. Mm. Because the Zen four has really nice architectural improvements. So the seven five is a Zen three. Yes, hmm. I think so. What just happened? Yes, the uh, Zen free based, just like the workstation CPUs. Where I don't think there's a Threadripper or Threadripper Pro with uh, Zen four already. Only the APEC and Ryzen's have gotten hmm. a refresh so far. Well, a boy can dream. Um, thank you so much. I gotta run and. I wish I'm afraid I do too. A great yeah. commander of the week. Good idea.